I just want to let you know that this is a recording of a brand new podcast that has been developed here at the University of Waterloo, Faculty of Health. What we're doing here today is building a relationship with the university, with all faculties, to find a way to bring Indigenous knowledge into perspective and to all the great courses that we offer here at the university, and to find a path of reconciliation that allows us to participate in society in the way that uh, we can share knowledge and to build friendships, allyships, and support for each other's uh, way of being. We live off of the theory that was built in 1613 called the Turo Wampum, which talks about our paths traveling down a river. And in North America, we consider it to be a river with the two nations held together by love, peace, and friendship. And when we can do that, we have a a better chance of developing a sustainable living standard for future generations to come. And when we can build into that agreement uh, new innovative ways to balance technology and to work with our beautiful mother, the earth. And, and this podcast is really about building these relationships and finding a way to acknowledge the important work that has to take place over the years. So we call the show Nish Vibes. Nish Vibes really just comes from the heartbeat of the drum. And when we hear the vibe of the Nish, Nishnabe. We know that we've come together in a good way. And so today, this is our second program. Uh, we had one previous to this and worked, worked, out, worked out really well. So today, what we're going to do is have a good conversation. No really script. It's just a matter of uh, how we define our, our, our words and our experience together and uh, what is on our mind you know, today. So we have a very special guest today, and I'm really happy to introduce you to you, the Dean of Faculty of Health, uh, Dr. Dr. Lou, Doc, Dean Dr. Lou, <laughs> who's... Uh, Hello. Ani. Ani. Oh, miigwech. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and, and, and sharing uh, your time. I know you're a very busy person, and you have a lot uh, going on here at the Faculty of Health and across the university so um, maybe we'll just get into a, a bit of a conversation and, and see where the, uh, the words go. It's my honor to be here. Thank you so much for your invitation. <laughs> honor to be here also. Um, so you've been here how long now at this university? Just over four years. I'm into my fifth year as of July. And you came from outside the province. I did, yes. Uh, my academic career was in Alberta, in Edmonton specifically, and then prior to that, um, my most of my schooling occurred in Quebec, in Montreal. Oh, yeah. so you traveled and around a little bit. I have, yes. And even prior to that, I was uh, born in Taiwan, so an immigrant to Canada, and spent some years in Toronto before our family moved to uh, Quebec. So you first came to Quebec, and that's where you went to school, and then you went to Alberta? Yes, that's right. Yeah, went to Alberta for my academic career, and then fortunately was able to uh, find this position here at Waterloo, which has been the highlight, I would say, of my career. Oh, that's great. How did you find it? Like, was it uh, announced, or were you searching at the time? Yeah, the usual academic way. Um, I was ready for a change. Wasn't quite ready to retire yet, but needed some challenge. Was experiencing a need to grow in other ways, just trying to expand my experience, but also looking for opportunities to be closer to family, which is uh, out here in the eastern part of Canada, along in the provinces of Quebec and Ontario. So your education was in, in the medical area? You were, yeah, you were, you in, were the health, in the health, uh, health sciences. So I was um, educated as an occupational therapist and then um, to some clinical work, particularly in adult mental health. Uh, after that, in two locations, my first job was actually in Nova Scotia, and then I went back to uh, McGill, where I did my undergraduate and did my master's and PhD there in rehab sciences. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So it kind of led you to various things in your life now you're doing. Would it be more administrative here? Yeah, I would call it academic administration. I still am able to keep a research program going, mainly because I have um, a large research team that spreads between you know Western and also um, Canada and also here in, Ont- in Ontario. So the type of work I do is not restricted to the walls of a laboratory, so it's much more community-oriented. And uh, I have to say, although the theme of my research work has, um, hasn't changed, it has really grown in meaning because it now also includes Indigenous communities. So what is your research project? Is it, can you give us a kind yeah. of an idea? Uh, well, even as a young um, graduate student, well, as a young occupational therapist, I uh, worked in men- adult mental health in you know, psychiatric units, I used to call them. And back then, there wasn't the field of gerontology or even geriatric medicine was very rare. So I would have this caseload, lots of individuals or, um, you know, um, older adults that were on psychiatric units that were living with dementia. So they were really cared for by neurologists or by psychiatrists, not the specialty of geriatrics or geriatric medicine, which uh, is an indication of my age, I think. That is definitely blossoming and has been blossoming as a field <laughs> of, uh, of education, research, and also professional practice. And so that was the road I chose to specialize in, to spend time learning about ways to assess and develop effective intervention strategies for managing and helping individuals to live with good quality of life into their older years. I continue to do that now and very much focus on uh, risks of going missing because wandering is a risk that people who are living with dementia experience. And I have to say, working with um, the Indigenous communities has really opened up a whole other perspective for me that, um, for example, just even the concept of dementia doesn't really exist in the teachings of Indigenous ways of knowing, respect for elders, all of that that I kind of grew up with in my own culture, in the, in the Asian or Chinese culture, has come full circle, really resonates well with me because... Yeah, it's just such a such an honor and a privilege to be able to work with families who are trying to preserve meaning and uh, at the same time struggling with the challenges of managing these these risks uh, as uh, their older family members become, you know, less able to look after themselves. So, because dementia wasn't really talked about very much in indigenous communities. Are you you finding any resistance to that or or are people open to learning more about dementia in in First Nation communities? Yeah, I think um, they're surprised to, not surprised, but they're interested and intrigued when we explain and uh, show them from Western literature that um, it is related. It is an illness. It's not a normal part of aging, but it's related to brain health, which is related to physical health. And so, of course, we know that there are um, higher prevalences of chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart conditions, and all of that would affect the brain health. And so it's natural that we would see a higher prevalence of dementia in Indigenous communities. So that's interesting to them. But we learn, there's, I don't sense that there's resistance. In fact, we learn from Indigenous communities that, uh, from you, as a matter of fact, <laughs> when I first met you, I asked you to join us, um, my research team, on uh, at, you know, a particular meeting and just explain to us what does dementia mean for Indigenous communities. What do you call um, someone who is, or the condition, how do you describe the condition of an older Indigenous adult who is um, uh, getting lost and uh, the first thing I remember you telling me is, well, we, we say that the person is not just old, but very old. And then we just share our observations with the community, and we look after them as a group, as a community, which is such, a, such an important lesson for all of us, you know, in uh, the Western approach to looking after older adults is to segregate them into nursing homes or continuing care facilities and let someone else look after them and then there's barriers set up and so I find that there's a lot that we can learn from indigenous communities and ways of knowing. So you've been working with uh, a few different indigenous communities uh, closer I guess uh, and they're part of your research uh, Mm -hmm. teams 
So these communities, uh, what are they, the ones that you're working with? Uh, currently, we're working with um, Pike West First Nation mm-hmm. in Manitoba and also with uh, Ganawake, which is just south of Montreal in Quebec. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's great because mm-hmm. there's two different kind of concepts there with the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee creation stories and things. So do you find any differences in how they relate to their elders? Is there anything that stands out? Um, not really. Uh, we haven't really had the opportunity to go into the differences between the different uh, mm-hmm. communities. Um, but what is common and clear to us is the, um, you know, we're outsiders going in and we needed um, relationships to open the door for us. But um, what really strikes us is just um, the concept of sovereignty and ownership of data. We hear about it, we learn about it, and of course there's policies written about it in our training as we train and educate our own graduate students. But nothing hits home more than actually showing up for a first meeting with a band council or the elected chief and then hearing the words coming out from them. The first word I recall going to Pegasus First Nation from the uh, chief was, um, was a question, actually. You are coming back, aren't you? And I thought, wow. And so... Um, that really resonated, and it hit home that in just that brief question, he is telling me everything um, I've heard about and learned about, and is expected of us researchers who are working with indigenous communities that um, we have to respect the data that is collected, that we need to go back and share it with them, that it is their data, and uh, they need to be co-collaborators on the on the the research that we do. And uh, that has, in fact, guided, that first question has guided us throughout all the work that we've done with them. Uh, I'm kind of glad that question was asked because when I uh, seen researchers come into the communities, it was just to get the knowledge that they were looking for and then never to be seen again. And I think uh, we've, from one ethnic group in this country, probably the most studied ethnic group, you know, ever, uh, everything that we do, every time we go to Walmart, it's it's marked, you know, through our status card when you use that. And when you buy gas, you know, everything's always marked. So I think we're the most studied people in, in Canada. But this is what I think causes a little bit of misunderstanding is because none of that really comes back to us to support our statistics and, and how we can strategically move forward. So Mm-hmm. That question is really, really important uh, for most Indigenous communities. So. Mm-hmm. so I'm glad you're studying that because it's really important that we're looking at other things that are happening with Indigenous communities in relationship to health. We do know the statistics today are still not very great for uh, mortality rates and, I guess, uh, living standards on First Nation communities. So this is where this work will really support you know, our ability to to join, you know, with the better standard of living in, in Canada, and hopefully we can achieve that. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think an important aspect is, and certainly now putting on my hat as an academic administrator, being at the seat of important decision-making tables, that I use this power to open doors into, in the spirit of reconciliation, support initiatives that are going to be able to um, equalize the um, decision-making power among Indigenous peoples. And it means access to education. It means access to professional status that will allow them to provide the kind of care that Indigenous clients and and, um, patients are seeking. And uh, often just having a um, professional who understands the culture, who represents the culture, uh, takes away the fear, I think, of clients wanting to seek help. Even though I was in, for example, Kenora earlier this year, and it was shocking to me how locally, like standing from where I was visiting, I could see numerous hospitals and healthcare centers and long-term care centers among this um, hugely um, diverse indigenous communities. And yet, what I kept hearing was that they don't want to access. If an ambulance shows up, they won't get in it. And so I think there's still a lot that needs to be done to break down the barriers. And uh, one way is to have more Indigenous uh, health professionals or healthcare workers out there so that um, there is a, a like-minded approach to 
providing care. Uh, no matter how much we try uh, as non-Indigenous um, individuals, we can never understand completely the perspectives and the needs of Indigenous people. So we really need to have a better representation in terms of number of um, service providers, I would say, in the health sector. So something fueled your attention to this at this university a few years back, I think, when you were looking to include more Indigenous knowledge, especially here in the Faculty of Health. Uh, mm-hmm. What, like, were you, re- you know, outside your project, was that really the spark that got you thinking that we needed to bring that to this university? Because you kind of were the front runner at, you know, of all the faculties here of trying to bring Indigenous knowledge. I, I suppose there was some, you know, throughout mm-hmm. the university, but but you really went to bat and tried to make some changes here that's, you know, really, really important. Yeah, no, uh, my research actually with um, Indigenous populations came after that. I arrived uh, in July of 2019, and uh, the Faculty of Health was already on its way to developing its strategic plan. So they started in the fall of 2018, and then over a period of about a year, a little less than a year since my arrival, we pulled together and uh, tightened up and uh, finalized our five-year strategic plan which um, was to run from 2020 to 2025. And one of the four signature commitments, and I like, I kind of smile when I say signature commitment because commitment has become such a, an important <laughs> yes. word in our relationship and since your arrival. So, of course, one of the signature commitments was to, as it was stated at the time, was to foster Indigenous and facilitate Indigenous ways of knowing. And uh, I had no, we had no idea, but it was one of the four signature commitments which spoke to how important this was for the entire faculty. And this is based on hundreds of consultations with hundreds of people and community, alumni, et cetera, and this was identified. We had no idea how we would do it. But that's the purpose of a strategic plan, isn't it, is to provide a roadmap, a roadmap to remind us And uh, I felt really good about that, that we were willing to take the risk and put that on our strategic plan. And as as it turns out, that one little statement, I believe, was what attracted you to us and was how we (laughs) were able to, to, although it was challenging and not easy because you you still are currently in such high demand, but you were, of course, well-established in another location. But I saw you a few times during the pandemic, providing openings, uh, smudging ceremonies, Your um, ability to impart your knowledge and your wisdom in a very gentle way but not intimidating really struck struck me and resonated with me. And so um, we worked worked really hard behind the scenes to create (laughs) this um, path and to invite you. And I I always say in the end that you, you selected us, thank goodness. And then it really was... That was how the whole thing started. I realized that uh, it's not something any of us can do. We have lots of excellent talent and researchers who do research with Indigenous communities. What I do is just very, very small compared to what they do. They, their whole career um, you know, focus is, is with various types of Indigenous communities. And, uh, but there was no representation. We don't have Indigenous faculty members here at the uh, in our faculty. So we really do need to, and I didn't even know how many Indigenous students we have. So we really did need, we didn't even know the terminology to use, but we then eventually landed with a knowledge keeper and a special bonus that you're also an elder and a previous chief of a nation. And so, um, so that, that was really how the whole thing started. And it was really, um, the way I saw it was creating the space for this to happen. And eventually what came afterwards you came on board in February just a just a year and a half ago only in the number of things that we have done all these firsts right we had a first commitment ceremony with the faculty in um, in the summer June I believe of uh, just 2022 we just had a sorry yes 2022 we had our second one 2023 Mm -hmm. and shortly after in September of each of the two years we had the president lead the university in uh, a commitment ceremony attended by the entire campus. I see that as a timing and a lot of luck. We happen to have leaders, and in this case, President Goel, who was ready. He could have waited two years. He could have, the university could have, you know, for, but immediately, in just a year and a half, under his leadership, we've got you, we've got indigenous 
openings and closing to every single convocation ceremony. We have the eagle staff. We've got raising of the eagle feather at uh, for the first time at a sport at a at a basketball game. We smudge. You smudged the football players <laughs> with the, uh, the recent um, you know uh, football game, black and gold fest. There was just so much uh, that has happened since your arrival. So uh, I wouldn't say it was because of me at all. I think uh, it was a matter of timing and people being ready. And I have to say the community, they do look up for the leaders to be exemplars. And in this case, we happen to have just the right people in the right place at the right time. So the commitment ceremony, like, how do you think it filtered into that level? Like, we did it here at the Faculty of Health, but they were watching and and you were maybe reporting to them, you know, in your meetings and stuff. Uh, did that stimulate them to want to do it at a, at a macro level, do you think, or was it something already? I think it was you. You were in, I believe, uh, that's just it. I haven't had to do very much, actually, except to facilitate, to encourage. I think you were at some, there's a, an Indigenous elder council of some kind, and uh, you happen to be close to the president and you talk to him or perhaps the chancellor and again it's a matter of being ready they were ready for this and like me you're an opportunist when it comes to <laughs> yes. to getting the message out so I think it was it was all you're doing and I <laughs> applaud that <laughs> well it goes both ways you know it's yes. a matter of people wanting to know and yeah my life experience oh keep hitting this on there my life experience you know is seems like it just wanted to come out you know especially at a certain time in my life and uh you get to a certain stage where you hope that, you know, people hear and see what takes place from that. Because, you know, throughout life, uh, Indigenous history and current events were out there, but not a lot of people were paying attention to it. Unless it was a roadblock or something like that, you know, which uh, kind of uh, made, life, made life inconvenient for others. But we, we wanted to turn that around and, and, and show the, the good side of Indigenous. It's not all closures and negative stuff there's some positive stuff when it talks to our about health and the way that we you know view spirituality and things like that so i think that's really the the motive that comes at a certain age and then you start thinking about how confident you can be with presenting that and that's kind of like how i you, you know some people today especially after the residential school situation are really angry and hold a lot of anger and, and i can see where that anger comes from but i think if you, you got to balance that out, you know, and then people will listen more. I was worried about being in an academic situation where we honor the letters after your name, you know, the PhDs and, you know, all those titles. And it was always my perception that if you don't have those, then people don't really listen to you, you know. They only listen to people that have those titles. And so I thought maybe how are people going to listen to me, you know, without those big titles like that? And And then I found out that, Society did change, you know, somewhat that wanting to know a little bit about history and, and those titles, what, what I come to understand are, are almost just as equal as a PhD. You know, I think uh, probably isn't recognized at a university that way, but I think in our communities, when you have that knowledge, it, it, it's just as that level or even stronger sometimes. So that's where I tried to equate that, you know, knowledge into a, a system that didn't necessarily be built on that. You know, and I think that's what we need to do at schools and other places. I agree. I agree. And I, I think before you arrived to the university, we had ceremonies. You know, we have orientation. We have the usual, but it was always to me to be a um, in convocation. Of course, the, the the most important ceremony was this rite of passage to um, congratulate our ourselves for making this happen for each of the students, but also for the graduates as they embark on their career. But uh, these ceremonies contain much more meaning now that um, because with each ceremony, you also, uh, it really resonates regardless of what background people, people come from. But what um, I find Indigenous teachings brings to um, the kinds of you know, ceremonies that we have on campus is that they um, remind us of where we come from. They remind us of our ancestors. It's so important for those of us that are, for example, my age, where I no longer have parents. It's such a comfort to be reminded on an almost regular basis that 
the ancestors are with us, and also to think about our children in the future. You impersonate for me the uh, seven grandfather teachings. One of them is humility. And I come from uh, a background where my parents, because they immigrated, they were looking for opportunities, like many other immigrants, in North America and Canada. And that, um, in the process of doing that, they made many sacrifices. They didn't have the opportunity to go to school and to have a formal education. Yet, I would say, even now, even today, some of the, um, some of the best lessons that I live by actually came from my parents, especially my mother who lived by these values, and she didn't have a PhD, you know. I still remember her quotes and you say, and so it's such a comfort for me to have someone like you to come into our lives here on campus to, um, to bring those, those kinds of wisdom. And I was actually, prior to, to today's podcast, just thinking about the seven values happen to be the same number as the seven grandfathers teachings seven values that our faculty of health identified as important to us when we were doing this strategic plan and i thought well how do they line up with the seven grandfathers teachings and they do they all overlap of course right but humility then i find maps onto very well with community to, to be not to be selfless or not selfish to find balance from within the, the community, and community is one of the values that we have, um, we set as one of the you know important values for our faculty. So I think um, I think what you speak to, uh, it's interesting hearing you talk about credentials, because it never occurred to me that you would you would have even niggly thoughts of perhaps insecurity about that. But I thought, wow, that is totally. Yeah, we have sometimes, often I deliberately drop the credential, just call me Lily, because I think we have to all be reminded that we are not our credential. We strive and we work really hard to it, hard for them. And even at a time when our students are graduating, they get this credential and they should be proud of it. But uh, always remember that we have to level the playing field for everybody and that there's wisdom to be gained from everyone, right? We learn from our students as well who may not have as many credentials as we do. Well, I think that's something we, we've come to live by because I work at the Law Society, work with the lawyers here, and then OPP, and they all have these titles that, you know, I respect it, and I respect them all too. But uh, to strive for those, it's a great thing. You know, when people put you in those positions or you've earned those roles are really good. And, and same thing in Indigenous communities, you know, in our clan system. You know, we it was more rounded where uh, a leader wasn't, necessarily the top person maybe they're the facilitator or, or somebody who got the conversations going and they were given the term chief or, or elder you know those those terms but uh, they really sat with the community in the circle and become part of that circle and then the titles were released you know when we get in together mm -hmm. and have conversations because those conversations didn't really warrant having those titles it was a matter of building knowledge from the people who are there and if they see you as a higher level. Sometimes they feel they're at the same level. So when we bring ourselves to that level of all the people, then I think there's more comfort in that for, for anybody to share. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, just a kind of what I've observed in the ceremonies that we have. And, you know, I'm kind of looking at society that way too. You know, universities or structures that we've built are very colonized in a lot of ways. You know, they're, they're script, scripted in a lot of ways. Right. And we need, need to live up those. But I think that's what decolonization really does. It's kind of stripping away those who can't live in those circles because they don't have those credentials, but they still have knowledge. And I think that's what decolonizing it is, bring it down to the level where everybody can participate. And I don't know, that's kind of the think, thinking I'm at this university, you know, is, is uh, when we do bring elders in from the various communities, you know, they're, they're paid as well as, uh, you know, professors and they're respected as well. Because that was always missing in history when they brought elders into schools, they give them a Tim Hortons card, or you know, you know, okay, thanks for your your hour, you know, and it really wasn't as uh, honored as much as it should have been. And I think our elders are seeing that now, you know, like I think what they bring is something that is really important. Yeah, I, I agree. So there's that self advocacy aspect, and. You mentioned respect, and respect is, of course, one of the seven grandfathers' teachings, and I equate that with equity in our faculty uh, as one of our seven values, and it is about that, isn't it? It's um, truly respecting 
the um, value that a person brings. But it also begins with the person knowing what their worth is, knowing their, their limitations, but also their strengths and what they bring to a particular relationship. So there's knowing that. And then early on in the stage of a relationship, particularly within your community, to be able to let um, those who have, don't have the credential, who are not the chief, not labeled as a le- leader, but letting them know that um, you welcome, this is a, a, sp- a space for them to sh- share their critical thinking. And that really should be ultimately what a university is about, that our young people f- can really be free to think, think critically, to question the norm, And when we question the norm, first of all, we need to know the truth, as in truth and reconciliation. When we know the truth and we know the history of what happens then is then we understand how did we arrive at these arbitrary decisions of drawing a line between Canada and the U.S., arbitrary decisions of um, faculties even, right, or creating these silos, dare I say even why we have two official languages in Canada, French and English, leaving out all of those First Nations peoples. And um, so I don't want to undermine the importance of those historical events, but they are, when you, when you see the truth in the history, they do seem arbitrary in that time, really. When, and, then, and then it's not that in decolonization we want to dismantle, or it's even feasible to dismantle, but we can reconcile, such as, um, a, a good example would be the recent decision by the university to waive tuition for students coming from the mm-hmm. two nations on whose territory this this university sits on. You know, so I think those are steps in the right direction. It was interesting when you said the the two official languages. I was traveling through Sault Ste. Marie, and I came to the border, and the custom agent started speaking Ojibwe to me. He was non native. And I was, what? Are you speaking Ojibwe? He said, yeah. He said, I sit here all day, and um, I heard Canada. We have two official languages. He said, I don't believe that. I said, we, I am going to learn one of the official languages that Canada should have. So he learned how to speak Ojibwe, and uh, it was an honor to meet him every time because we'd, we'd speak in Ojibwe. And, yeah. I, love, I love that story because it's a demonstration of an individual's decision yes. to, um, to act in a reconcile way and uh, our partners in Kahnawake for example Quebec always when I lived there was always the same it hasn't changed it's always mandating the French language right and as a nation the Mohawk nation they say no we're not going to use French in our you know so they pushed against it and in in the kinds of um, communications or um, meetings that I've had I've also in trying to find Ojibwe and also Mohawk language people who are proficient in those languages to help us translate the products that we've developed uh, from our research. I've come to realize that, um, sadly, there aren't very many Indigenous peoples who are proficient in those languages. So we need to really help these communities bring back their language. If it's, and I'm sure it's very similar, if it's anything like Mandarin, which I, I speak, there are expressions and uh, ways of life that are lost with a language if you do not preserve it, right? So I, I totally respect the need to preserve the French language, but there are so many other languages, especially of the First Nations peoples of uh, Canada, that we need to really help preserve. The, the interesting thing about that is these recommendations been made a long time ago. We, we knew the loss of language was uh, yeah. was happening, and... I think after the Oka crisis, which happened in Ganasatage uh, back in 1990, after the Royal Commission was uh, completed their their work, those recommendations were about language and about unity, you know, within the community. And then the way the pattern works is they would get put on the shelf and nobody touched them again for years. And then all of a sudden, Ipperwash happened, and then there was another. Uh, recommendation come out of that, and then it sat there, and then the the residential school started coming to light in Canada, and then the TRC was struck, and then recommendations out of that, 94 recommendations, calls to action, which we've only accomplished maybe under 20 of them, you know, to this point. But 
that's the pattern that I've seen in my lifetime. You know, we were popular and then not popular. And then always the recommendations were always the same <laughs> all the way from all those reports. Even going back to 69, you know, with the red paper. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but it's a government in Canada. Pierre Trudeau wanted to get rid of indigenous rights and, and just make indigenous people regular Canadians. And so get rid of the Indian Act and just make them Canadians. And we balanced that out. It was called a white paper. Uh, we balanced it out with the red paper, which was uh, the rebuttal to that. <laughs> so, you know, what I'm saying is, though, we've, we've seen all these over years, and, and now we have to make that commitment to get these recommendations done. And I think at the governmental level, I, I think we're, we're tired of that now because every government that comes in says they want to do these things and create reconciliation, but it fades away. So now let's get to the universities. Let's get to the yep. high schools. Let's get to the students. In fact, this morning um, when I was speaking to the students here that are here on campus today, I, I did my usual song and I left the last verse open for those who have passed away. And a student came up right after me and said his, his sister was indigenous. He passed away and that had so much meaning to him. He had to come mm -hmm. up and, and tell me that. And I think that's, that's what I mean by you know connecting and having this important you know, opportunity to share. That way, it's 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 really hitting home where I think we need to. Um, I'm just kind of frustrated with government uh, that talks about things but really doesn't move in that direction. Yeah. So we're at a place now we can do it. We can do it. We need to put the future generation with this sort of experiential learning into government. So um, we can work at it in a multi-prong approach. I often go back to Jim Becker, our VP, AVP of Indigenous Relations, who recently, when she presented their, their strategic plan for, from Indigenous Relations, often go back to the, her reminder that the impact has to come from Indigenous-led initiatives that are supported by non-Indigenous community partners because the Indigenous peoples can't do it on their own. The non-Indigenous community or individuals need to create a level playing field and also represent and um, fight for rights, ways of, you know, bringing this next generation, future generations into those leadership positions. And so um, I, I think uh, while we can continue to be, to work with existing government, it's endless in number. I hear what you're saying. I'm, in fact, I'm so impressed with your resilience and your patience. But uh, I think this approach of getting to the, not just university students, but also the, the younger, future university students, post-secondary college students, et cetera. And it's wonderful to see them coming to campus as well. And we certainly have worked together to bring high school students here. Not those that are already in the contemporary education system, but those who have never left the reserves or their indigenous communities really help them see that uh, it is possible for them to reach their dreams. I, I think that's really important because, you know, the education levels is still skewed, you know, mm -hmm. in, in statistically, right? So this is where I think if we want to see hope, you know, this is where we can do it. And, and if we're acting out in that capacity here, you know, and I think we're front runners in a lot. There's universities that have done a lot of things across Canada and, uh, you know, people in communities have done so, but I think, like you said earlier, you know, we have the right personalities here right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this recommitment ceremony we just did a week ago, it was uh, positioned to the president, like, what about when you're not going to be here? You know, it's, it's fine while you're here, and I think it'll go fine. But it might, might not always be that way with another president who might have different priorities. You know, so how do we stabilize that into the charter of this university? You know, and he committed to, you know, working on that and trying to build that within it because... That's just nature, you know, people change and different ideas come into play. So, That was a very stark question that you posed to the president who represented the, the university campus. And it was a, it was a tough question because um, you're asking the leaders of this university, you're saying this is all fine, you're doing this for a second time, but how can you guarantee that this will be permanent, right? And it's a, it's a question that uh, we're not going to be around to be able to see it, but it's a fair question, especially based on the cyclical experience that you've had of 
reports being shelved, more task forces coming up with the same recommendations, then being shelved, but very little action, right? So I would say that my hope would be actually that these first, second, next year will be third, and you're calling us forerunners, which is kind of nice, but that, uh, in fact, it will go on onward into the future and that we won't even remember who was a forerunner because everybody will be doing it, and that... Um, these demonstrations of our commitment is no longer going to be seen as new, um, but it's going to be like ingrained and in, in woven into just the fabric of how we do things. And that um, when we say this is the Waterloo way, it actually includes all of this that we're talking about today. That, that's just music to my ears, you know, to have that happen. And, and maybe that's where we're going in society, hopefully, you know, with other organizations, because we did one for Toyota last week, and that was their 11th annual, so they've been really working hard at it, uh, Law Society, and now we're working one with the Grand River General Hospital. So these commitment ceremonies, I think, you know, they're foundational pieces, but we grow up from them, and we learn, and what we're seeing now is new staff here and, uh, you know, opportunities for professors. We can't even fill, you know, because, you know, there's just there's so much in demand, and so, but at least the dream is still there, and we're still working on those things, so... Uh, so I think it was good. To, you know, it was it was fun watching this all work and looking forward to more futuristic ideas. We'll get more people that come in with other ideas and and see how they grow. And you know, and people like yourself in positions that make this so much easier. I've worked in places where it wasn't as easy because the leadership wasn't. You know, economy became more important than, than the morals of of the institution. And that's when you fight the struggle because you know what needs to be done, but, you know, if economy is more important, then it doesn't fit anymore. So I think this is where I've seen the difference, and, uh, you know, you've been a, a great leader in that, especially demonstrating that here at the Faculty of Health and throughout the university, so, uh, and other deans here, you know, that I got a chance to know, you know. Some of them a little, little, little wanted a little pushing a little bit more, you know, but uh, I think they're coming around, and, and now I'm hearing more talk about wanting to have elders in, in other communities. Some are exploring it right now, and and I think that's what I, I call success anyway. So anyway, I want to thank you for uh, joining me today and having uh, this conversation. We can talk for hours on, on so many different subjects. And uh, I just want Niche Vibes to be informative and to bring people here to talk about what, uh, what we're doing and how important it is for, for, for everybody you know, to see this happen. So is there any parting comments that you're interested in? Just so grateful, grateful for you and grateful for your teachings and your continued commitment to us um, and faith in us to um, be able to make these changes that are so important. And uh, miigwech. Ah, chi miigwech. (laughs) Thank you so much, Lily. It's uh, been a pleasure to work here and uh, it still is and looking forward to the next couple years and see what we can do also. So uh, that was our our second segment of Niche Vibes. We've... uh, we will be uh, meeting other people throughout the university over time, and we'll be um, learning more about the university and, and even trying to get some more indigenous music you know, incorporated into the podcast. We've been running into some situations where uh, there's, there's rules on podcasts, and uh, we are, we're trying to get music played. So we're going to play Redbone as soon as we can, everybody. <laughs> That's my, my theme song that I always played. So... Anyway, uh, we're going to close off today's show and want to thank uh, our technical assistant here, uh, working hard to make this happen, and our uh, special guest, uh, Dean Liu, that's here at the Faculty of Health. Miigwech, everybody. We'll see you again next time, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Chi miigwech. Miigwech.